Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly pod and video cast brought to you by the magazine of free minds and free markets and unfree lunches. That is foreshadowing. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Hi, everyone. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Monday. So uh, it's not. Uh, this is going to be an extremely disillusioning week in American politics, and not just because it's going to be a week, uh, but rather um, consider this gruesome headline in uh, The Hill, which is a newspaper. Uh, this is from yesterday. Uh, Trump-Biden rematch hits overdrive with Super Tuesday State of the Union. I think that should be in, in newscaster wow. voice. Trump-Biden rematch <laughs> hits overdrive with Super Tuesday State of the Union. Nick Gillespie. Well, um, the good news is that uh, Nikki Haley won Washington, D.C., so thumbs up, America. Uh, and also, uh, No Labels is going to finally make its uh, secret uh, the decision on Friday of what to do with itself this year. Um, thank God. Well, they're not going to label themselves. No, that's not, what we know. Not, not quite yet. Um, it's, uh, it's Lent. So that means at least we all don't have to drink kerosene, uh, so far. Um, it's times like this, Nick, uh, that, uh, the two thirds of Americans who hate this <laughs> right. <laughs> tend to go looking for the Hail Mary passes and the magic bullets and the other mm. metaphorical <laughs> terms that Catherine loves so much. Um, uh, just looking for any alternative to the system that's puked up these results. So today's episode, we are going to go into the weeds of those potential reforms, open primaries, ranked choice voting, ballot access laws, stuff like that. Uh, but first, I want to talk about a little uh, magic bullet that was just swatted down Superman style by the Supreme Court. It wouldn't be better. It is the Supreme Court. So it's Supreme. I think that's what we got to do. That. Uh, it's the Supreme Court. Uh, nine uh, zero. That's unanimous for those of you scoring at home. Uh, it started. Uh, this happened just an hour before we started taping. Uh, the high court told the state of Colorado to take a long walk off a short pier with its uh, attempt to uh, disqualify Donald Trump from the ballot because he's an insurrectionist. Um, Catherine, why don't you lead us in a quick round of Insta reaction here on the Reason Roundtable podcast? My Insta reaction is this was uh, for the best. And I think that is not least because here on this podcast, we generally prefer for electoral outcomes to be decided by voters and not by a bunch of jerks uh, with too much power on their hands. And um, in this case, the Supreme Court was not... Not wrong to take this case quickly and rule definitively. Um, if our ultimate goal is, as I think it should be, to get to a peaceful transfer of power rather than to get to a specific electoral outcome, this clearly maximized the chances of that. So good work, Supreme Court, I guess. Nick, I speak for you when, and me when I say our ultimate goal is to not stroke out um, between now and November. But how did how do you uh, react to this news? I, I agree with uh, Catherine that I'm, I'm glad the Supreme Court ruled that Trump can't be kicked off the ballot. But, you know, the reality is over the weekend, I, I rewatched the South Park episode, uh, a Giant Douche versus Turd Sandwich. And I was like, wow, from 2004. And it's like, oh, you know, God, those were better choices than we have. William Styron Sophie had a better choice than we have in 2024. Reporting for duty, Nick Gillespie. Peter, what say you? I think this was basically the right decision by the Supreme Court. I was reasonably convinced by an op-ed in the New York Times um, uh, about two months ago by Kurt Lash, who just did a close reading of um, the relevant provision in the Constitution and argued that it is ambiguous. And so when you have a novel case of huge importance uh, that would just radically change elections in the United States and the provision is ambiguous and the history and the, uh, of how that provision has been read is ambiguous, you don't go and kick the likely presidential contender for the Republican Party off of a bunch of state ballots. Also doing that and allowing states to do that, I think this is one of the points that the Supreme Court makes that's, that's interesting and relevant is that if you had... If you did this at the state level, it would cause chaos. 
if you had even 41 states where Trump was on the ballot and nine where Trump was not or whatever the number would be, having different ballots uh, across the different states would be incredibly chaotic. And therefore, it just like from a process standpoint, it would be a bad process to allow some states to go ahead and do this. All right, let's proceed into our specific political. Matt, reform. are you happy with it or are you livid with rage? I'm sorry. Let's consult the uh, moderator of this podcast. Moderator, what say you? Oh, I'm busy moderating the podcast, so I'm going <laughs> to right. move the discussion yeah, along. Yeah, no, I agree. You're just going to be a traffic cop. Strokes out I mean. really just increased here, and yeah. frankly, I'm I'm maybe willing to accept the trade off of like one of you strokes out, but we get the peaceful transfer of power. Is that something I, I can have? I agree with all of you. And don't have anything meaningful to add to the discussion beyond the uh, let's stop at some point doing the mini cannons, the mini toy cannons. <laughs> um, that were popular from like 2017. Like, oh, this one's going to finally boom it off. No. I really thought you were talking about Jim Wynn of the uh, <laughs> gas race, Matt Wells. The toy cannon. Toy cannon for the, the win. The t-shirt gun of democracy. Aren't oh, no. we glad we asked Matt? Okay, uh, yeah. Catherine, uh, let's get into our specific ideas. But before we do that, this is not an ad read, but let's get to a more like a general proposition as a palate cleanser throat cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it here. This soon after Ayala's birthday? I don't know, man. <laughs> it's, too, it's too soon. Uh, libertarians love to talk about <laughs> faulty designs and incentives and such. To what extent do you reckon, oh, perfectly haired editor in chief, uh, does our political and governance dysfunction derive from our kind of uh, kind of architectural design flaws or bad rules? Yeah, I mean, I guess I want to start by being a little warm and fuzzy and saying that our political function, to the extent that it is successful, derives from our design. And so I want to like props to the founders for getting most of it right. Um, so let's start there. But the partisan dysfunction that we are seeing now absolutely could be ameliorated. It could be at least... Um, it could be like less painful for all parties with some tweaks to the process. So yes, I do think um, the way that our election, uh, the structures of our elections have evolved over time, um, they are not inevitable. We could be doing a lot of these things differently and that there are some places where we're doing it differently would produce outcomes that, I mean, it, you could, the trouble of course is that there are many different things you might be looking to maximize. So one might be like more democratic outcomes and one might be more orderly outcomes and one might be speedier results. And so that it kind of part of the issue here is like no one even agrees what we're maximizing for, much less how to maximize it. Um, that said, there are some of these proposals to kind of fix our elections, as people often say, that I do like. Uh, Nick, you yes. surely fondly recall uh, when we were touring around America, our book, The Declaration oh of God, Independence, yeah. How Libertarian. Oh, my God. It was a different exists. country, Matt. It was, in fact, a different country, but a lot. It's the same John Cougar Mellencamp, uh, thank God, and Bob Seger. Yeah. Um, uh, but a lot of people at the question and answer, this was like the third most popular question, uh, was, uh, yeah. don't you think that if we did fill in the blank, it would uh, fix yeah. everything? What is your sense of um, that there is uh, uh, that, that that X percentage of our problems are design flaws? I am going to, uh, I think, go against probably the consensus of the three of you and say very little. Mm -hmm. It is this is not an architectural design. The house is built and it was standing for, you know, a couple hundred years. The dysfunction, and it may not be that, but the, the polarization and the issues we're seeing now isn't because we don't have representative government and elections that get us there. It's because we do have representative government and elections that get us there. There is no consensus on what the government should be doing and how we should be living as a country. And our elections and our politics reflect that. Um, there are tweaks that could make things better or worse. I, for one, you know, I want to see more candidates from a broader range of, uh, you know, positions, but they're going to be housed within the Republican Democratic parties uh, or the t whatever the two major parties happen to be. So I don't, you know, I think we're looking at a, a bug, uh, you know, that's actually a feature. I don't even know why I said that, but, <laughs> you know, we, we disagree, we disagree on, you know, what government should be doing. We have two parties that are as ossified and fossilized as the presidential candidates 
running them and the former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, who is like, she will be mistaken if she ever goes to the Louvre, they will put her on a fucking pedestal as a mummy. Mitch McConnell has been, you know, he's the Karen Ann Quinlan of American politics. We have a leadership that absolutely reflects bad politics, bad parties, and we are to blame. So I think Nick is right there to a degree, but let me push back just a little bit. I don't think that we have a design flaw in uh, sort of the, the fundamentals of our constitution, but I do think that there was a misapprehension, uh, an, an incorrect expectation on the part of the founders about how American government would operate at the federal level. And so they designed a system, as we know, with three independent branches. And what they thought was that the competition in government would be between those independent branches. And instead, over the years, in particular, in the last 50 years, we have seen the competition develop so that it is a partisan competition rather than a, a rather than the branches trying to sort of check each other. And that has created some distorted incentives. And then, in addition, in the 1980s, the Supreme Court made a, uh, a somewhat less uh, not very well known ruling that is now actually going to be back at the Supreme Court this year that I think was very consequential in exacerbating that. And that was... Uh, in a case uh, versus Chevron, and they, they developed a doctrine known as Chevron deference. And what Chevron deference does is it basically says that when courts are ruling on administrative, on uh, the government agency interpretations of, of the law, courts have to accept the government agency's interpretation if that interpretation is reasonable. And reasonable is a very, um, uh, that casts a very wide net, right? There's a lot of things that are sort of like, eh, that seems reasonable enough. That doesn't seem completely bonkers crazy. And so what that does is it incentivizes the administrative branch, the, the executive branch and the agencies to create all of these, uh, to sort of, to go far beyond the, 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 the text of the statutes that govern them and to do a bunch of stuff and then to present to courts, well, here is a reasonable interpretation. And then the court's hands are tied. And then in addition, because the executive branch has an incentive to do more and to sort of take on more, Congress has less of an incentive to solve those problems and to do the business of democracy and to actually sort of say, what, here's what we're going to, you know, here is what the law says and here's what we're going to do. What does that have to do with elections? I'm, and I'm not being obtuse. I mean, I, the administrative state is an issue, but it's like, you know, in terms of elections, uh, you know, is this the reason why Gavin Newsom is governor of California and Ron DeSantis is governor of Florida or why Joe Biden ended up becoming the Democratic nominee, uh, et cetera? I, I'm so not really. This is connection. not the only issue. This is not like I said, I, I think the system was basically designed right. And and the thing that it has to do with elections is it places more power in the executive branch, it places more importance on the presidency because the executive branch is in effect making law by interpreting law that then the courts cannot uh, by the, because of, of Chevron deference, the courts cannot say that's a completely ridiculous interpretation or that's just the wrong one. We're gonna um, we're we're not going to accept that. And so, by placing more importance on the executive branch, it disempowers the legislative branch. And so, at the margins, that reduces the competition between the branches and means that people that Congress has less incentive to do legislative work and much more incentive for, for example, um, uh, backbenchers to just try to make a name for themselves and sort of act out, right? And just sort of use Congress as a, a media platform rather than as a place to go and write legislation that is going to be different. And that changes elections. That changes how people think about who they are going to vote for and which votes uh, matter and, and how they are sort of think about their incentives as voters, because everything ends up getting kicked up to the presidency and Congress is just sort of sits there and doesn't even pass budgets. It raises the stakes for the executive catastrophically and lowers the stakes for Congress catastrophically. Yeah, I think I think to answer uh, Nick's question further um, is, is that oh, Peter's talking about the federal government. And this also points to uh, a, a feature of American politics that I think doesn't get enough um, consideration, which is that when we talk about politics generally, when we chatter uh, and, and write about it. It's usually federal and it's usually the gap between the president doing his stuff and the backbenchers being clowns. And um, and there's a big difference between that and what happens in the state and local level. Um, and there's a big difference in the in, I think, the consequences of what happens when you have a Democratic or Republican governor 
uh, or legislature on the state level, uh, the gap between policy is much more uh, striking. Um, and be- But because we're so fixated on the president and that, uh, we tend to think about that when we go vote for our state and local, even though the consequences are all kind of different and scrambled. I'm going to It has federalized the- politics and uh, people are just voting down the ticket. But And also, uh, to, to Matt's point, it is not an accident that the best, and that's not to say good, but the best governance, uh, the best policy governance in the United States right now is almost entirely coming from governor's offices and state houses. I uh, I will answer the question briefly by saying I mostly agree with Nick. I think we're getting the government we deserve good and hard on some level, um, and it's a reflection of our choices. My uh, interest, I guess, or suspicion or something is that it's the places precisely where the rules having to do with elections are written by the participants in the elections, the winners, um, to do stuff like ballot access and, uh, you know, the literal commission on presidential debates, um, uh, districting. Um, uh, it's in those places where I think uh, reform bits are most welcome. And yet I don't have a magic answer besides appoint Walter Olson to everything. Um, uh, it's kind of hard to figure out how to do this without the political competition. But I think that's where a lot of the reform lies. All right. Speaking of reform, let's get to it. Um uh, specific pluses and minuses of various tweaks. Catherine, I have increasingly heard uh, and have been increasingly persuaded by kind of this year, maybe even more, the notion that open primaries, allowing people who are not uh, members of given political par- parties to nonetheless vote into that party's primary election to decide who is going to be then put forward to the general um, is a good idea. The idea being that um, if you allow some outside blood to get in there, um, it reduces the kind of uh, uh, in-group contest of who can be the most sort of extreme or at least loudest inside the room, it's going to lead to overall moderation and so forth. We have uh, open primaries more or less in about half the states. Now, uh, what say you as that as an improvement on the existing status quo? Yeah, so I think if the thing you're trying to do is minimalize tribalism in is minimalized, geez, is minimize tribalism in politics that open primaries would help, right? Um, this is just, if, if you let the people who most strongly, personally, and viscerally identify with the party choose the party's nominee, you're going to get a certain type of nominee. And if you let people who are kind of interested in voting and stuff choose the party's nominees, you're going to get a very different person in many cases, I think. And uh, I personally... I'm guessing that I would prefer the latter category of candidate. But, you know, that said, I don't think we have enough evidence within the United States in recent memory about um, the differences in open versus closed primaries to say for sure. I could also imagine a scenario in which we get both parties nominating sort of mushy middle technocrats in a truly open primary system. And... um, that might suck too. So I don't want to. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves in terms of candidate quality, but the theory of minimalizing the minimalizing. What's wrong with my brain today? Yeah, minimizing. Maybe it's the hair dog. It's the tri. It's the word tribal and minimize that are joining together. And uh, if that's not what we want to say, I don't know what it is. The twenty twenty four news cycle has been minimalizing all of our brains. I, my brain is minimalized on this Monday. I morning think for the sure. party should have more control over who they nominate. Um, you know, if anything, maybe the problem isn't, uh, you know, isn't open or but that's closed different primaries. Than, but yeah, it's, okay. It's a, you know, the parties actually have in many, many ways lost control of who they get to nominate and things like that. Uh, there are a lot of people who blame the Citizens election, United so. for that, actually. Yeah, I know. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Citizens United was, was right. We have a great video about it. Uh, three reasons not to sweat uh, Citizens United, which includes a great bit from Rachel Maddow as well as Keith Olbermann. I mean, it is like looking at the past through a dark glass. But, um, you know, the parties exist in order to do this kind of work and to put candidates up who reflect their constituents, their special interest groups. And in many ways, anything that takes us away from that, I actually think might make their offerings less sharp. Um, So uh, that might be part of the problem. It certainly would have gotten us or probably would have gotten us Mitt Romney instead of John McCain 
in 2008. Um, right. given and I'm also, I, I, do we want moderate candidate or centrist candidates? I mean, that's what people who push for open primaries always talk about this. It, it, it eliminates the extremes. I don't know. You know, maybe that's good if in particular instances and then it's bad in others. I, I don't want to, I don't want what? a moderate candidate for freedom. I want to, I want a full threaded one. Uh, what say you, Nick, uh, to the objection that like, why should taxpayers be on the hook to uh, throw a closed political yeah. primary election? They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. Oh, interesting. Okay. Peter, yeah. what do you think? I don't think that there is any voting reform that is going to fix America's democracy. I think uh, there are some things, uh, some good things to say, for example, about ranked choice voting. But as Nick said, um, one of the effects of ranked choice voting is that it tends to sort of sand off the rough edges of politics. Uh, because what it does is it sort of is it finds a a, a more centrist ca uh, consensus candidate rather than just uh, picking the, the person who has the most votes and is often um, in some ways the most radical or most extreme um, from uh, particularly in a primary. And so that may be good in some circumstances, but certainly it would have uh, it would have consequences that no one would on this podcast would like, at least as far as policy goes uh, in other cases, because it would push things towards sort of the median policy preferences for voters. And the, the, median, the median voters' policy preferences are not very libertarian in a lot of ways. Yeah, but isn't it, I mean, it's, isn't it kind of silly to judge something, a, a proposed reform based on whether this little narrow group of us <laughs> feel, yeah, feels yeah. like it produces so, the so best it's, results? It's, I don't think it's silly. I, I think it is worth noting. And like I said, there are many things to like about ranked choice voting. That's how I started. And I, I think there's a, there's a bunch of stuff to uh, sort of a bunch of aspects of, about ranked cho choice voting to recommend. Uh, in many ways, the fact that we have a, a system that has, um, that has selected for partisan extremeness uh, right for sort of the the X games of candidates, right? The, just the most ridiculous, showy people, especially outside of leadership. Uh, that has that has brought on a lot of uh, American politics as problems today. On the other hand, the policy outcomes that would that would result from uh, more ranked choice voting would, in many cases, not to be to the liking. Of those uh, of those of us on this podcast and many of our listeners, and we should understand that there are good things and there are bad things about all of these reforms, and none of them are just going to fix democracy or or solve America's uh, governance problems. In part because of what Nick said earlier, there just isn't enough consensus right now about a a whole lot of things. And until we find that consensus, until somebody sort of can say, "Here's how we're going to do it," whether that consensus is we're all going to do it the same way and we all more or less agree, or actually our consensus is going to be there's 50 different ways to do this, and we're just gonna, you know, what that's that's how, that's that's how it's going to be. Whatever that consensus is, we have not found it yet. As stipulated at the top, uh, none of these are considered to be magic bullets. We want to consider them piece by piece, whether it's uh, good or bad. Um, and since Peter uh, led us to our next one, let's talk about it, Catherine. Uh, ranked choice or instant runoffs. The basic system is that if the four of us are running for president, mm. uh, voters will rank God us forbid. In, in order of preference. I and... pledge to get the United States out of Rhode Island. Uh, We've been Nebraska. there for almost 200 over you over 200 years. And what have we accomplished? It's time Nebraska to bring first. the boys home. Uh, and uh, so whoever comes in fourth place <coughs> uh, will then uh, after everyone, the voters rank. What the choices. name did you cover up with that cough? <coughs> Nick. Uh, Whoever actually, comes in fourth place. I was, I was, I was so conflicted between Nick and Peter yeah. that it was, uh, that it was difficult. And that's purely a careerist move more than anything else. But um, <laughs> why is um, the you rank voters rank them in order of their preference, and the person who comes in fourth place, all of the fourth place person's voters, then their votes are redistributed to the second place person. You keep doing this until someone gets more than fifty percent. We have this in Maine and Alaska. Mostly, it's also in New York City, four dozen cities, uh, including New York, on uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, Nick, as you know. Yeah. Well, uh, it's kind of trending. It's growing. Sarah Palin is not in Congress because of it uh, and other things. So, uh, Catherine, how do you like ranked choice voting? I have grown to like it more over the years. I used to kind of just be like, listen, 
nerds. That sounds fine. Um, and But not really um, give it a lot of thought. That um, is your modal response as an editor. <laughs> Listen, nerds, that sounds fine. Um, I actually think the, the rank choice bros of like 10 years ago really remind me of UBI people. <laughs> like it's the same energy of like, they're maybe not wrong, but also there are so many different proposals and people really want to talk to you at great length about the details of the proposals. And it's not clear there's consensus or anything remotely approaching consensus around any of them, ironically. And so, okay, like sounds fine, bro. It sounds fine, nerds is sort of where I end up. But I've changed that view partially because I've seen it actually, as you say, in action uh, in the U.S. Uh, to seemingly decent effect. And also um, because I, I actually think um, a little bit contra what Peter was saying, that the, the value for ranked choice voting uh, for people with heterodox views is that you can you can see some of that in the numbers, right? So if you if you can kind of run single issue candidates that people can express support for uh, within a ranked choice, you can see that preference. You can kind of make yourself visible. And uh, I know we're going to, I don't want to cheat us ahead, but um, people are using the none of the above option in Michigan last week to do that. They were trying to, trying to be seen in the numbers using the choices that were available. And I think that that actually is a valuable tool and I would like to, I would like it to be available to more people. So ranked choice bros, you have won me over. Let's do it, I guess. I think the, uh, you know, the results in Alaska with Sarah Palin and another, you know, Republicanoid candidate and a Democratic candidate who ended up winning actually shows like there's something wrong with that. The uh, the voters of Alaska seem to have, by, you know, their massive votes preferred somebody from the Republicanoid side of things. And they did not get that. Um you know, and while many people delighted because it means that Sarah Palin is going to go back to, uh, you know, running a social media website or something like that. Um, you know, it, it strikes me like it does. It doesn't seem like Alaskan voters were, uh, you know, the will of the people such as you can divine that from elections was well served by this. I'm not sure the will of the people is necessarily a partisan preference. I think the the virtue of ranked choice voting in that case might be that actually Whatever the appeal or lack of appeal of Sarah Palin is, it transcends Republicanoid or not Republicanoid, and that that yeah. gave people a chance to express those differences. And the just like the, the preponderance of negative feeling towards a particular candidate, right? Like if if people are feeling incredibly polarized against someone, if they excite those types of emotions, uh, doesn't it make sense to have a way to express that rather than voting for their single? Yeah. Uh, uh, Preference. What I what I do like about uh, or what is always combined with ranked choice voting is the instant runoff, especially if unlike yeah. the city of New York, you can actually do it because you're not run by incompetence, um, you know, uh, doing something that precludes the need to run a second election at great taxpayer expense, as we saw in Georgia, might be, uh, you know, might be a good thing. Uh, let's just kind of grab bag the rest since we can't spend the entire podcast talking about this. Catherine, you clearly want none of the above and uncommitted and other ways of saying hell no on, <laughs> hell on, with uh, these assholes. on votes. Yeah. What, what's um, your what's your favorite uh, otherwise reform sit, sitting out there on the table that people talk about? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm none of the above or die, but um, I will say I was uh, doing a little research for this for this topic and uh, I had forgotten and I fear our listeners may have forgotten that uh, in the 2012 election, the sore loser uh, provisions that um, that perhaps on, on perhaps which is so much hinged since uh, Gary Johnson uh, was three minutes late to withdraw from the 2012 Republican primary and therefore was denied access to the libertarian ballot. Um, these are the sore loser rules are rules that prohibit you from um, from doing this cascade of cascading from major party to minor party. There are a bunch of different ways they work. Sometimes it is through this timed mechanism. Um, sometimes it's just a rule that you can't do it. And the LP tried to resolve this by finding another dude named Gary Johnson. That's true. <laughs> Who was going to stand in for Gary Johnson? And it's I actually don't remember all the details of how the two Gary Johnsons were later going to be collapsed into a single Gary Johnson or something in like some kind of quantum 
mechanism, but um, I, I I had forgotten that that glorious low key moment of uh, procedural comedy, and I wanted to remind everyone. This is like that guy from the state of Washington who changed his name to absolutely nobody and won 7% of the vote <laughs> for the lieutenant governor's office in the early 1990s. This is my candidate. This is what I'm talking about. Wow. Catherine might actually go to a ballot box to vote if she could vote for absolutely, absolutely nobody. nobody. Nick, uh, I, I do encourage I, again, people to write I, us all in on their ballots. I, that's a great joy of election season every year for me is like I get a couple of photos on my Twitter feed of people who wrote in one of us and I, I love that. Uh, sore loser laws are preventing uh, the uh, likely preventing the uh, long awaited marriage between no labels and Nikki Haley. She's, of course, ruled it out running uh, on no labels, although she has said many times uh, things like yeah, Americans really hate this rematch. And I'm going to fight for those Americans who hate the rematch, which sounds pretty no labelsy. But she's prohibited from running in eight states worth a combined 131 electoral college votes because she ran in this cycle as a Republican and you can't do it uh, otherwise. Uh, and again, these are these are pretty recent. This is the exact thing where the Democrats and Republicans say, OK, I don't like that thing. So let's do a new rule um, uh, that pre prevents that thing from happening for competition. Nick, I feel like you want to say something. Yeah, now that's I, I think that's awful. It's stupid. Um, I, it's I think wrong. what you wanted to say is that Gary Big Hands Johnson from the San Diego oh, Chargers yeah, okay. should be on every. I also somewhere in a box I have a sore loser man bumper sticker, which was the <laughs> refrain that uh, Al Gore and Joe Lieberman were referred oh, to God, in the yep. uh, 2000 election. Those. Um, Back when Catherine and Peter were, and it's amazing because Joe types. Lieberman was what like eight hundred then, but he's still around. Like we still have around. this know, no Nosferatu labels. class of politics. I mean, they're like John Wooden, you know, where they look, they always look like they were eighty, and you know, they get out of politics when they're fifty or something. He's still trying to ban Mortal Kombat. Just mad that there's another one. Uh, I will add, uh, perhaps to to top this off, unless anyone else has a burning reform. Um, I don't know how it, I wouldn't necessarily mandate any of these things, but I think when people talk about debate criteria, presidential or otherwise, um, but let's presidential specifically, if you get on enough ballots or your party gets on enough ballots where you could win a majority of electoral college votes, you get you get at least the first debate. That's 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 Matt's reform um, here. I think that's, I like that one. Uh, you know, one thing the 15 we haven't talked percent about. threshold is ridiculous. Um RFK Jr. might get close to that this year. Uh, maybe So then you know, they'll change it. They'll change so it. They'll change it. But I don't know if Trump or Biden, but especially Biden, want to even think about having debates uh, given everything else. All right. Well, that, you know, is also just fascinating to think about, you know, do debates matter? Um, I mean, I would love to see more rather than fewer or be able to read the transcripts. But um you know, whoever puts the debates together should be able to define the criteria and, uh, you know, the candidate should be more willing to participate. But of course, they're, you know, they're not going to be. Um, and there were no presidential debates, televised presidential debates between after 1960 until 1976. Um, we have some good articles on why that happened. And did it mean that those elections in between were less representative of America? I don't know. One thing we didn't talk about was uh, was gerrymandering, and um, and I do think that there uh, the gerrymandering has been a problem. Uh, it is not great that the vast majority of House seats are not competitive, and the reason why is because whoever's in charge every decade or so uh, redraws the lines and ensures that they are not competitive. And Eric Baim did a great feature for Reason Magazine a few years ago about how actually we should just have those lines, the the district lines, drawn by computer. And we should just let the robots do it for us. And that would produce uh, fairer, uh, better drawn uh, uh, electoral districts and uh, more competitive uh, house races. And that would be good. Maybe we can have Gemini uh, AI. <laughs> draw Absolutely them. right. You know, so we're, we're getting a lot of black Nazis in the yeah. Central Valley of we California. Don't, we don't for need some AI reason. to do it. We can use old fashioned computer technologies um, to do slide this. Slide rules. Slide rules for redistricting chair. Yes. You know, I, I, I agree with you completely, Peter, but also because I know Matt will uh, appreciate this. When you see what happened to California at the state level, which 
the Republican Party there imploded after having a really good run. And it is because they repulsed most of the voters in the state at the uh, at the local uh, and state level in the 90s. Um, so uh, there's no question that gerrymandering and redistricting and all of that matters, but it's also you can overcome that. And, uh, you know, for instance, in New York, uh, in the, the last election, there were a bunch of Republican wins that were kind of, you know, totally unpredictable. Uh, but you can overcome that. But I think we got to go back to the fact that the two parties suck at the local level, the state level and the federal level. And like until they get their acts together or we as voters kind of push them to come up with better coalitions that represent more of Americans, we're just going to be stuck in what Morris Fiorina calls unstable majorities for, you know, until that happens. Uh, more uh, Walter Olson in charge of gerrymandering and everything else and more uh, uh, drag queen Republican volleyball player. Um, all right. Uh, we're going to get to our listener email of the week here in a moment. But first, a reminder that this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Friends, what's the first thing you would do if you had an extra hour every day? Would you swat the gnat that's flying in front of your face while you're doing a, a podcast? Would you sleep in? Would you study Mandarin? Would you work even harder on that overdue feature for Catherine Maggie Ward? Uh, well, therapy can actually help you prioritize the things that are important to you. So time becomes less of an excuse for you to do the work. That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp is an easy to use, super flexible, entirely online therapy service that has helped many listeners of this podcast machete through the blah, blah and cut straight into life's big challenges. All you have to do is fill out a quick questionnaire, get matched with a therapist, if you don't like the first one, you can just swap them out for a second. Let therapy be your day organizer and your attention span declutterer with BetterHelp. Just visit BetterHelp.com slash roundtable right now to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, <coughs> H-E-L-P dot com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Remember to please email your short queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Ricky Blackman. Uh, who writes, howdy, hey, Matt, and happy Monday. That's good. Uh, what are your favorite, he writes with a U, not so good, Ricky, uh, short quotes from fiction that present libertarianism. Mine is from the end of Terry Pratchett's Witches Abroad, as follows. You can't go around making a better world for people. Only people can make a better world word, world, sorry, for people. Otherwise, it's just a cage. End quote. I'm still unsure, Ricky uh, concludes, whether that final sentence should be included or not. Catherine, you love this question too much. What's your answer to it? I do. You, Matt put this question in the chat uh, to prepare for the podcast, and I was immediately like, oh, actually, it, it was a little embarrassing. Um, yeah, Terry Pratchett, now and always, is the source for excellent fictional um, you know, freedom quotes of various kinds, uh, libertarian quotes of various kinds. But I will offer y'all um, some Octavia Butler, a uh, newly somewhat trendy, but um, always beloved of a certain set of libertarian author. Uh, she There's a, an epigram at the beginning of the parable of the trickster uh, where she says, there is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. And I think about that a lot. Um, it's the perfect mix of like, People are going to be people and they're going to kind of just make the same mistakes over and over. And you have to really accept that and internalize that. But there, like the world does change. There can be radical, exciting moments of change and we can pursue those. So Octavia Butler, honestly, all of her writing um, has just really, really cool, subtle themes that um, libertarians can appreciate and should foist on their friends. Um, this is not the same as handing somebody Atlas Shrugged. You're you're going to get away with this. Uh, Peter, how do you answer the question? The year was 2081 and everybody was finally equal. That is the first line to Kurt Vonnegut's great, incredibly libertarian, uh, incredibly relevant short story, 
Harrison Bergeron. And it's not a libertarian epigram in the sense that it sort of declares the inherent, you know, uh, that all men desire freedom in the hearts of the... I think that's actually a line uh, from Optimus Prime in the first Transformers, right? The, uh, like the all sentient creatures desire freedom or something like that. Um, but it, it's so obviously ridiculous and so obviously absurd, especially coming at the beginning of the story, that it draws attention to the silliness and to the ridiculousness, the absurdity of that premise, of that idea that somehow or another, everybody is going to be equal in the most equal way. And then, of course, the rest of the story is great, too. Um, but it's it's a great uh, it is a, it is a great libertarian story and a great libertarian line because of the ironic way that it underlines uh, highlights the the nonsensical goal of, uh, of, of true equality of uh, what we would now call equity. That uh, that line, that story, uh, along with the uh, everyone going out to bounce the rubber ball once uh, a bit from a wrinkle in time, uh, just absolutely were the most terrifying totalitarian images of my childhood and probably turned me into a weirdo. Uh, Nick, speaking of weirdos, uh, what is your favorite Thank you. Uh, libertarian? You were a weirdo novels? already. You got the causality reversed. Mm hmm. Uh huh. I will uh, confess that I don't have a, a good choice here, but I've always loved uh, this passage from The Great Gatsby, uh, where Nick is driving into the city with uh, Gatsby. Uh, and um, uh, what is funny, Matt, and you'll enjoy this, they're, uh, they're going over the Queensboro Bridge, the 59th Street Bridge, which is now named after Ed Koch. But the city scene from the Queensboro Bridge is always the city scene for the first time and its first wild promise of all the mystery and the beauty in the world, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, Nick Carraway, who is the villain of the piece in my reading of The Great Gatsby, says, anything can happen now that we slid over this bridge. I thought anything at all. Even Gatsby could happen without any particular wonder. And what I like about it is just the idea uh you know and i obviously have uh written about the great gatsby for a reason but it is a book about people creating the world they want to live in and then many of and and it's an account from the people who are incapable of living in that world of increasing laissez-faire across every dimension of human activity so i like that because it foregrounds the idea that you slide into a place where anything can happen anything can come together and be done and, uh, you know, people get worried about that. Uh, my answer is uh, Ten Stafel, um, which, of course, is the uh, acronym for there ain't no such thing as a free lunch, as coined, at least the acronym, um, by Robert A. Heinlein, who was my gateway drug to libertarianism as a, as a teen. Uh, this comes from The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, his 1966 novel about a lunar revolt against the colonizers of uh, the United States or wherever the world. Um, uh, there's another line in there, one way or another, you get what you pay for. I like this thing for a couple of reasons. One is that um, it has that kind of similar uh, thing of like, huh, makes you think. Um, uh, it, it also makes you think about kind of economics and government provision of services. It um, uh, immediately throws you into kind of econometric type of thinking even if you're trade-offs trade-offs uh even if you're 12 years old um and i also like it because of the absurd acronymization of it uh is uh kind of what sticks to some people and definitely predates uh all of the uh baseball stat nerd overly long um, uh, acronyms that uh, came a lot of it from people who had read similar things when they were kids. And then that all of course became what we live with now with texting and social media, just ridiculous acronyms. That's not even acronym. That's not even the right word. Is no, it? Uh, abbreviations, um, kind abbreviations, of. Uh, whatever. you know, Matt, uh, no, you mentioned that's a, acronym, a 1966 a book. I would love to see you do a treatment of, so that's the same year revolver came out, right? Like, do a kind of uh, glimpse of what were the uh, the major transformative things that came out in a given year. You've done that with songs for particular years, but what's the connection between The Moon is the Harsh Mistress and Revolver and maybe a couple of movies that came out that same The year? Moon is a Harsh Revolver. Uh, I, yeah. two, two things I will remind uh, everyone that uh, that was my high school uh, thesis paper is A Stranger in a Strange Land in the Summer of Love. 
uh, and how it like, was a direct influence upon grok that. till you drop. <laughs> never stop grokking. Never learn yeah. not to grok. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, also, I think that the the song to do that, Nick, yeah. and I've uh, yeah. been uh, been cogitating on this for a while, uh, is "Paint It Black." That should thrill oh, yeah. your nihilist soul. But that sure. is such a incredibly galvanizing song with really really interesting uh versions yeah. in various languages and it just like touched off an entire feature and fun fact by far the most uh downloaded uh or most uh number Stone's of whatever's track? on uh spotify yep wow paint up, paint so up. I, can i just recommend very quickly that people check out the eric burden and the animals version of paint it black which has a scat stanza or five that goes on for what seems to be about 30 minutes where Eric Burden is like, Hey baby, I'm I mean, he sounds like Telly Savalas, you know, like baby, <laughs> I'm not seeing any colors, not yellow, not red, not orange, not green. And, you know, it's like, yeah, we get it. We get it. So but if Robert so Heinlein good. had a voting drive, would that be grok the vote? That would be I great. I hate it yeah. here. <laughs> I like that. I, I understand Grok in the original Martian. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, if you're going to be talking about Eric Burden, you have to say, uh, point out that House of the Rising Sun was part of the uh, the lead up to Paint It Black. It was very, uh, uh, his version of that uh, kind of mm. introduced a new type of sound that Brian Jones thought interesting. Okay, Catherine, we're going to wake you up now. Uh, but first, I, we're gonna yeah. let, let's wake up uh, Peter. Uh, Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader, already mentioned on this podcast negatively uh, by Nick Gillespie um, earlier uh, announced last week that he is not going to be seeking re-election after November. Did he announce that, Matt? I don't know. It was, or the people it around him. It was announced. It's something that's happened. Um, we'll we'll let uh, TV's Andy Levy decide at halftime uh, exactly how that came out. But uh, Peter, you followed Mitch McConnell's career pretty closely. Uh, he is pretty much derided by everybody in American politics at this point, but with a lot of uh, grudging and sometimes not so grudging respect uh, among Republicans, especially those who are uh, interested in things like judicial appointments. Can you give us a sense of what the post McConnell world looks like? What are we going to miss when he's gone? That's a good question. So I, I think to answer that, you have to go back and understand what Mitch McConnell was. And what Mitch McConnell was, was a master of procedural politics for better and for worse. And that's in great contrast to the newer MAGA-E style of politics uh, or even the squad style of politics, which is very media centric, which is uh, about grandstanding, which is about getting attention on social media or uh, getting on cable news, but is not so much about using the internal level levers of power to actually move legislation or block legislation to act to do stuff um, from inside the legislature. And I think there were things that were good about it, things that were bad about it, and things that were quite mixed. And so one good thing is that uh, is that McConnell recognized that a thing that he could do to advance his causes was to move the judicial appointments. And so he moved judicial appointments, um, many of which uh, folks listening to this podcast would approve of. Um, and that has really changed American politics. And And Mitch McConnell is in many ways the architect of the Republican judicial strategy. Um, uh, a bad thing about Mitch, Mitch McConnell was that I think that aside from the judges, and maybe even, um, maybe even you could fold the judges into this in, in some ways, in so many ways, his priority, his priorities were almost entirely partisan. He put the Republican Party and the fortunes of the Republican Party, specifically the electoral fortunes, how many elections are you going to win? That was the thing that he that motivated him most was he was just going to try and put uh, GOP butts in seats in Congress. Right. And that was and, and if the number was was higher, then that was better, regardless of the policy outcomes. And um, and then there's a sort of a, a, a mixed view of him. That is, uh, you know, Justin Amash has often critiqued a Republican leadership. And um, yes, Amash was in the House and uh, McConnell's in the Senate. Um, but McConnell is part of this. Justin Amash has often critiqued Republican leadership correctly 
for over the past couple of decades, centralizing power, where bills, to the extent that they are passed, are drawn up behind closed doors uh, by just a, a small group of people without a huge amount of input from the backbenchers and the rank and file. And Mitch McConnell was definitely part of that. But I was at one of these uh, sort of uh, dinners you go to in D.C. where you meet people who are staffers on the Hill or used to be leadership staffers. And this was a person who made the argument to me that in the absence of McConnell, um, we would have had a much less Reaganite, much more populist Republican Party much earlier. And that Mitch McConnell... Uh, his centralization had the effect of holding the line on old style Republican Party politics, especially with regards to uh, defense spending and tax cuts, but also to some extent with social spending that he tried to reject. And again, this was not like he was a, a champion for Medicare reform or Social Security reform or anything like that. At, but I, I do think that you can you can make a plausible. I'm not sure it's exactly the best case, but a, a plausible case that Mitch McConnell's efforts to centralize the legislative um, uh, mechanics uh, inside the Senate, um, what they did was they kept the Republican Party in that sort of Nikki Haley Reagan zone uh, for a lot longer than the party would have stayed there naturally. And that probably had at least some positive policy effects from a libertarian perspective. I can see that Nick doesn't like this. Um, so I, again, I'm trying to per, uh, you know um, present a, a mixed uh, a mixed portrait here. He did judges. Uh, that was good. Um, I think his partisanship was quite bad. And I think his centralization had um, a bunch of effects, some of which were bad, some of which were good. Um, uh, but kept the Republican Party from going full MAGA and full Trump uh, in, in policy terms um, as quickly as it might have in the absence of somebody like McConnell and in the absence of centralization. Go, Nick. I think that uh, Mitch McConnell will go down as being one of the most powerful and negative influences on the Senate. He's in a John C. Calhoun class. He absolutely put partisanship and, and a single-minded purpose of, of controlling things and controlling power, uh, you know, front and center. And he was able to exert that over many parts of the federal government. From a libertarian, a small L libertarian perspective, I would argue, even counting the judge stuff, he did virtually nothing to increase and expand individual liberty uh, and, 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 you know, a, a libertarian world in his term in office. I am glad to see him go. And I hope only that he's replaced by people like Rand Paul, who at least can make a gesture towards a more libertarian world where power is decentralized, not only at the local level and the state level and the individual level, but at the federal level. He was a plague on American politics. And I hope that his example is seen as the exact thing that we do not need from elected officials, particularly people controlling either the House or the Senate. Catherine, would you care to triangulate between your two colleagues? You know, I'm, I'm mostly with Nick on the so long sucker, don't let the door hit you on the way out kind of approach. But I will in maybe the only time I will ever do this, uh, associate myself with uh, Elizabeth Warren's remarks about Mitch McConnell. Uh, in which she said, I've disagreed with Mitch McConnell a whole lot more than I've agreed with him, but he mostly fought to keep the government functioning. And that I do think is true. And I think that that is the thing that we are not necessarily going to be able to take for granted going forward. And, you know, I'm all for the government ceasing to function, of course, but I would like it to cease to function in an orderly and principled way and not in a chaotic and uh, stupid way, which I fear Instead of getting someone with more libertarian impulses in place of McConnell, we will get someone with more chaos monkey uh, kind of energy and that that will be the thing we miss about him. It certainly will be the thing that Senator Elizabeth Warren misses about him, um, but maybe me too. The I'll just add uh, without making grand proclamations that the uh, about the only productive little season of national politics in recent memory, uh, from my point of view, was between eh, 2009 to 2014, maybe 2011 is better, to 2000 and late 13, uh, somewhere in there when the Tea Party uh, kind of uh, yop, barbaric yop came to being and um, Republicans, even when they didn't have a lot of power, but uh, had at least some in the House of Representatives, particularly were able to 
um, post uh, the great bailout um, uh, and uh, and the stimulus afterwards, we're able to hold the line on spending, including defense spending, uh, military spending for a couple of years there. Um, and all throughout that process, up until it ended, and it ended in November of 2014, um, the biggest Republican um, uh, like uh, objector to any of that type of behavior that led to those positive results was Mitch McConnell. And as soon as the uh, 2014 election came and Republicans now control the Senate and the House, Mitch McConnell was first out of the gate saying no more shutdowns, no more debt ceiling uh, negotiations, no more any of this kind of stuff. And that's when spending started going through the roof. It predated Trump, but Trump goosed it, didn't care about it, didn't run against it. But it croaked that politics, um, which I thought was a productive and interesting politics. And once that politics was done, that its champions and adherents, including and especially Rand Paul, who was running for president back then, was now no longer the center of attention and, and in the middle of the most crucial debates in Congress. It's a bad moment. Uh, McConnell was on the wrong side of that. And the other thing I would say about uh, him, and this is uh, plenty, I can find plenty of uh, self-described libertarians who vociferously disagree with what I'm going to say, which is that uh, his blocking of uh, the Democrats, Barack Obama's attempt to nominate Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court and just rejecting it out of hand, I think, was uh, uh, on a process level, regardless of the result, terrible for American politics. Um, I think it says that we are going to put presidential elections as a functioning legislative branch body. Uh, we're going to put presidential political considerations first. Uh, and just have a kind of will to power uh, idea about how we go about our business. Uh, that was a bad precedent, and it will be continued in the future forever, uh, at least until there's a new politics in this country. The end. Uh, to bring this back to what I said about Chevron, uh, Mitch McConnell played into that um, and in many ways made the made the uh, made Congress sort of a body that is less competitive with the other branches and one that is less willing to do its do the the basics of its job and legislate. All right, let's get into our end of podcast, what we have all been consuming in the cultural arena. Peter, I understand that you stood in a long line to the bathroom. Do you want to talk about it? No, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I didn't. I don't want to talk about that at all. Okay. Um, but you did go to the movie theater in which there were long lines in the bathroom from what I understand. That's true. I, uh, I saw Dune Part 2 twice, actually, Ooh. once in IMAX and once not in IMAX. And I'm going to see it again tomorrow Gosh. with Catherine Mengi Ward because it's awesome. It is. <laughs> Sounds like he's perfectly willing to consider that option. <laughs> I took my wife and she enjoyed it and that was good enough. Um, so I was really thinking about this movie in the context of its sci-fi lineage. In a lot of ways, uh, Dune, the novel, Frank Herbert's 1960s novel, is a response and retort to Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. Um, and then, of course, Star Wars uh, borrows a lot of elements from Frank Herbert's Dune novel, right? Uh, the sandy planet of Tatooine, the giant worm, and um, the Empire Strikes Back, right? And, uh, George Lucas was absolutely using that as part of his kind of collage material, along with like World War II fighter footage and Akira Kurosawa and all of that stuff. And then, of course, um, Star Wars, uh, you know, gave way, right, has sort of become the like 50 percent, 51 percent of pop culture over the last 40 years. I'm exaggerating a little bit for effect here, but it's become this huge force. And now the Dune movies that are out are kind of re-commenting back on Star Wars. But if you go back to where all of this started with Foundation and Isaac Asimov, what was Foundation? Foundation was uh, Isaac Asimov's science fiction retelling of Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And you think about how much mind space has been devoted to these science fiction stories over the past decades. And it really turns out that the meme is true. Men cannot stop thinking about the Roman Empire. And so that's what I came away from Dune 2 with. All right. So you liked it? Yeah, it's really good. Okay. Um, you know, Fremen Freedom. I think we're going to need like a, a holiday to celebrate it. Dune Teenth. Oy. Uh, <laughs> Nick, what, wow. did you, what did you consume that you would like to talk about without getting into Gibbon? 
Well, I also want to point out that George Lucas uh, stole from Dune the original or the 1984 uh, David Lynch version, uh, which featured Sting wearing a diaper at the end. Um, some of that shows up in Star Wars as well. Um, and I will, I'm forever Dune, the David Lynch Dune, which is that, but that's because I dislike the novel and the, everything that emanates from it. Although I think Peter is absolutely right in his um, categorization and characterization of it. So I uh, will talk, I had two things, but I'll limit one. it to one, Matt. Thank you. Yes, and that is Andrew Hickey's podcast, A History of Rock Music in 500 Songs. Uh, he is up to, almost up to uh, episode 200. These are multi-hour long kind of disquisitions about music going back to the late 30s up through um you know he's up to various points in the early 70s uh with things uh he just finished a four-part arc that involves the birds and particularly graham parsons uh which is probably a total of about eight hours uh, this is like rock history if D dan carlin of hardcore history was doing it uh, these are phenomenal, weird, uh, you know, uh, meditations on how rock music, which is really pop music uh, in the post-war era, came into being. Uh, Hickey is a strange British guy. He sounds like Alan Rickman on a tranquilizer. Um, <laughs> he is, uh, it is just a, f if you care at all about popular music and about how that intersects with all sorts of different creative commercial political and cultural uh happenings over the past 70 years a history of rock music and 500 songs is unbeatable um it is truly amazing and uh, you know i am uh, the the most the acid test of it is that i listen to episodes about songs and artists that i actively dislike and i come out uh, seeing the world anew for the first time it's really a triumph of the podcast form um and i cannot recommend it enough i think that the birds and graham parsons um tell a story about the um the possibility the technological the cultural the aesthetic possibilities of the late 60s that was going to fail um in its inception um and so that particular four episode uh series is just an incredibly deep rendering of stuff i know very well and i learned a ton on this and i think everybody would uh you know it regardless of whether you like the the subject matter you will be amazed that somebody pieced all of this together in a way that is a beautiful uh multi-dimensional work of art i highly highly recommend a history of rock music in 500 songs by andrew hickey I have had um, more people come up to me in the last two weeks and recommend that podcast than have probably re recommended all podcasts in the history of the world up until that moment. Um, friends in LA who play music and have been in the industry one way or the other for 30 years will say the exact same thing that Nick just said of like, I know everything about X and I learned a whole bunch about X. And I can't believe how right they got it and how interesting it was. So um, I can't wait to listen to it myself. Catherine. And there is tons of it. So, you know. Yes. Uh, Catherine, what did you consume? I am going to re-recommend something that Nick has recommended on this podcast in the past, maybe twice even. Um, I'm doing this because I just read it. And so it is fresh for me, but also because maybe you, like me, um, blackout while Nick is talking at the end of the podcast. And so you might have missed it. And it would be a shame. Back of the line, it. Catherine. Uh, you did. You did. I uh, also blackout. You woke, you woke mm. me back up with the phrase Alan Rickman on tranquilizers. So I actually did. I did catch some of that this week. Um, Julia, it is a retelling of George Orwell's 1984 by Sandra Newman. Oh, you guys, it's so good. It's just so good. Like, speaking of. Like, doing too good. It's Dune too good, Peter. I haven't seen Dune two yet. I'm sure I will enjoy it, but I, um, I love a retelling. I am I. This is already a genre that I'm in for. I will you know tell, retell me a Greek myth, retell me a fairy tale, retell me whatever. But um, because 1984 has attained this kind of um, mythological status, right? Like it's just, all of us have it engraved in our brains at an early age, and um, 
so this is subject to that same that same power of the kind of like retelling of a of a myth, the retelling of a foundational story, and and there is a twist which I will not reveal. But um, it's it's fantastic. And if you like me are a lady, um, you might particularly enjoy it because one of the most powerful things about this about this retelling is that it. Um, it really captured for me the experience that I had but wasn't able to articulate reading 1984, which is like, I'm not Winston Smith. I'm not, I wouldn't be like this in this world. He is, he is sort of too credulous and too uncynical in what I see as typically male ways. And Julia immediately busts through that and then does interesting things with it. Um, so it's short. It's it felt short. Actually, I have no idea how long it was because I read it on Kindle. Um, but it's it's really, really wonderful. Julia, a retelling of George Orwell's 1984. Go Can read we it. get a retelling of this podcast from Catherine's perspective? Uh, y'all. No. Just no. Uh, that's uh, what I'm trying to do every day. I am going to be the odd man out in that uh, my uh, pick here is not something that I'm going to very enthusiastically recommend. But it has been recommended to me so many times over the years that I finally decided to watch it. Uh, the Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. Cult, yes. cult sci-fi movie from 1984 starring Peter Weller as a uh, neurosurgeon slash like cold fusion scientist or something slash uh, musician slash- Jazz bunch, musician. Uh, jazz is a strong word. Um, uh, and a bunch of other things besides, and he gets involved and there's aliens and John Lithgow, uh, is a mad, uh, vindictive scientist. And, uh, and so this is a cult movie, uh, of longstanding. The nerds loved it. The kind of people who would recommend Robert Heinlein books to a teenage Matt Welch loved, 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 loved this movie. And I'm here to tell you that if you watch it in 2024, good luck. Cause it's crap. <laughs> it's just not good. <laughs> Wow. I went in there wanting to love it. Like I give me some Jeff Goldblum in his early phase. And I'm, you know, you had me at John Lithgow, Ellen Barkin, who was totally sexy in this. Uh, uh, fine. Uh, wow. This is just like it was filmed for a dollar 75 in San Fernando and Southgate somewhere. Um, it doesn't make any sense. It has a bunch of good one liners in the middle of a bunch of just stuff that it. it, it wow. So bad. Um, uh, it just reminded me of how many things, like if you were part of alternative culture in the 1980s, you had to put up with some really, really crappy production values. Um, and I think a lot of people, uh, want to hold on to those things, those, those totems of it, um, and, and say that they're better than they actually were. Um, like just, Nick with David Lynch's Dune. Uh, uh no, yeah, I like David Lynch's wears, Dune because, because it is terrible. Crap. Yes, uh, the, the, it's uh, it's the uh, Ouroboros of nihilism, or the, the Mobius strip of something or other. Um, but anyways, uh, wait, if the sandworm eats its own tail, yes, does it get high on its own supply of spice? Mm -hmm. Uh, anyways, uh, it's uh, it watches a cultural artifact, maybe. Or if you're like me and they've all been telling you for 40 years that this one's really great and it's a damn shame they didn't make 75 of them. Peter Weller is totally great in it. Um, and Peter Weller in general is always great as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I can only name two movies that he's been in. Uh, but uh, uh, it's it's no good. He um, was in three RoboCop films. Sorry, what, what, what? There are three RoboCop movies and he's in all of them. Eh, though, you only need to watch the first one. Watch the rapture with him and uh, Mimi Rogers, the first Mrs. Tom Cruise. Yeah, he's a great. Movie. Uh, right. He's great as the voice of Batman in uh, the mm -hmm. Dark Knight Returns adaptation, yeah. the two-parter that came out a couple of years ago. Okay. See, uh, Matt, go. if you want something that predates Buckaroo Banzai but is very funny in that same way, watch George, George Papard's Damnation Alley. Oh, uh, watch post, it, It's Nick. like the A-Team in a post-apocalyptic world watch 10 it, years before Nick. the A-Team. I watched it three times in the <laughs> same movie theater on the same day. It was playing in a double feature at the Paradise Theater, two, yeah. no, two movies for 99 cents. Uh, I watched it with the Gnome That's Mobile. That's got here, folks. Yeah, the Gnome Mobile. Sure. Uh, so Classic I would, Disney. I would yeah. peace out during the Gnome Mobile. I don't know what I would yeah. go do, go punch a clown or something, but then I would come back and watch Damnation Alley. Oh, Damnation and, Alley was so good. 
uh, so good. Just cockroaches have, have <laughs> giant, have, giant cockroaches have never been the same for me. God, it's fantastic. Damnation Alley. Watch that on a double feature with uh, Death Race 2000, and you don't need anything yeah. else in life. You've, you've already you've already won. Uh, all right, uh, that's enough winning. Speaking of Catherine being mystified by people being yeah. wrong in stereotypically <laughs> male ways, <laughs> I, I think it would be good to do it as the second Damnation Alley is the second film in a Not George Picard movie that starts uh, festival that starts with um, <laughs> Breakfast at Tiffany's. Oh, that's the journey that George Pappard travels from breakfast at <laughs> Tiffany's to Damnation Alley is like the voyage that the post-apocalyptic world takes from uh, a kind of fun and hip uh, late 50s, early 60s New York to a place where giant cockroaches are running the show. Um, that, that's all the uh, murder cockroaches that we have time for here on the Reason Roundtable podcast. Thank you for listening, watching uh you know uh d- d- pelotoning do people still peloton i don't think so but in case you were doing that uh thank you for your service uh <laughs> listen to all our podcasts at reason.com slash podcasts uh if you like what we do uh, as an organization please consider a tax deductible donation at reason.com slash donate uh and uh, nick do you have anything to uh to add about stuff that's happening in your world uh, yeah, and it should be up by the uh, time this airs. And if not shortly after, go to reason.com slash events on April 15th. We're going to be doing a Reason Speakeasy in New York City with Jonathan Haidt Ho-ho. talking about his new book, The Anxious Generation. So that's you, uh, April 15th. Are you going to place uh, Robbie Suave in the audience saying to say, say I dissent? At, uh, critical it moments. is just, so it's should. gonna, you know what? Uh, bring your cell phone. That's all I'll say. Ooh, ooh, titillating. Okay. Um, thanks again for listening. Catch you next week. Goodbye.